Yeah, yeah. So there's open space in there now. Okay. So as I'm sure many of you guys know, uh, Peter's been doing this series of talks at uh, four different hubs, um, organized around the concept of the four seasons and relating them to um, sort of uh, the history and positioning of systemic design over the decade plus two that it's that we've been around as a group, I guess. Um, and so uh, this being sort of the final the, the final hurrah, um, this is the last of those talks. Uh, and it's the coldest season is the metaphor here, yes. which I, I don't know how I feel about that. Um, but maybe it'll be maybe maybe it won't be chilly. So thank you, Peter. Welcome. Thank you for the introduction, Evan. Um, I, I, I think I know most of the people in the room by now, but um, I will introduce the talk, introduce myself, and I will also try to pace this longish talk for the closing keynote be, that's been um, we, I've been flexible and we have adapted to the contingencies of today and with the other talks. Uh, and I'm happy to do that, especially with this this last presentation. This may be the, um, the one that is uh, more um, speculative and perhaps less defined uh, than the others. As you can see from the title, um, as we get into winter, I'm uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the, I see this as an approach to uh, gaining perspective. So in the winter, when the leaves have dropped, snow on the ground, things are bright. You can see the distances, the different the perspective that we can take on our landscape may have um, may be more open. And the theme is for on the on the perspective for designing at the scale of the evolution of civilization is intentionally to really ask and bring in the question, systemic design, about at what is the largest level of a potential positive impact that that design for systems could, could benefit. Um, there, in, in a sense, this is also a critique of the global, because I don't think that we can design for the global, and policies for the global become subject to than the other units of analysis, which are quite large and also perhaps have more, the other related question to this is, you know, where are our solidarities? Where do we, where's designers in terms of having empathy for the participants in the system and the people that are gonna benefit from our work, even if it's at the largest scales, so this is definitely a macro scale and it's more theoretical, uh, but it's also dealing with issues that I think apply to the more tactical, practical, and you know, on the ground issues of, of um, what is our vision and uh, what are our constraints. So I think it's interesting to ask those questions at a larger scale as well. I won't read the poem of Ozymandias uh, right now. I just don't have, um, I mean, it will add a little time, but, I'll but you may know uh, Shelley's poem. You may know it from, um, that per the uh, particular episode of Breaking Bad, where, 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 uh, where it is read in the introduction, and and it just there are there are much better readings of this than I can do right now. But I just want to say I'm I'm taking inspiration from the history of hubris. <laughs> this isn't our hubris, but I want us to be aware that when we're addressing larger scales of systems that we run into constraints that are actually sometimes set by um, the inheritance of, of um, high visions that are not met or visions that are created out of uh, a view of power that that tends to, to you know th that that isn't may not even be aware that um, that that it is extending um, the legacy of hubris or of we might also say it's a misplaced solidarity. So, uh, you know, hubris isn't always overreaching our, you know, the, the, the limits of the policy of impact of, of a design. Um, I would say designers may tend to be bombastic at their worst, but are probably not hubristic. But there are, but we may, you know, be, but there are um, many uh, projects that I've encountered and, and, Contexts, uh, especially in 
in, um, in military and in policy and large, large corporate settings where there's hubris involved in making bad strategic decisions that we ought to be able to, to have some, um, uh, to have uh, better uh, concepts and ability to deal with the concepts and conversations to address those. So, and, uh, and so this is my kind of timeline for my positionality. I will say why, why I'm here, and two reasons. One is, of course, to give the talk, systems, history informed argument, but, um, but I'm here in the, in the sense of as somebody who rethinks and revisions a lot of the inheritances of, of uh, the systems field that I've come through and the design work that I've done that I to, to look for ways to be a pathfinder of the human spirit to re revitalize culture. And my, my ancestors, and so where I come from a long line of, of of, of explorer settler colonists. So probably the furthest back I can go is the Normans. And so I'm related to a Norman who, who settled after the Battle of Hastings in 1066. So that was, that was early, early exploration leading to, I guess, conquest. And then they, they, their descendants signed the Magna Carta, the Moulton. And they, they, I had relatives in the New World then settling Maine and Massachusetts Bay and were involved in the witch trials of Salem and were in the American Revolution, the Battle of Bunker Hill. These are written in, in the stories of history. Maybe others even have that too. But I see that as, you know, I, I, I'm not that type of explorer, but there's a way in which, more, you know, that my, the way I, I, I my trajectory may start from as somebody who's been in cognitive psychology and design. So I followed Don Norman one, Don Norman two, and now I think you know Don Norman is really part of our community as well as you know has designed for uh, designed for the better world, designed for humanity is in a sense very much a kind of manifesto of, of systemic design. So I was really happy he could. He was able to join us on the first day um, where I was in Bogota and, and, and also shared um, it, with our community with a, with a book talk that was generously extended to about an hour. But uh, in the other histories that I would add to that or that are now my histories are the development on beyond that with, with a number of different fields that I've been uh, fortunate to be at the entry points of. At the, you know, second CHI conference where, when there were 300 people in human-computer interaction, um, software system design, the, the, the dawn of the PC era, the end of the AT&T big system era in Bell Labs, um, in media platform design, back when one designer could design an entire platform um, as the lead designer, that was Science Direct, um, and working with the early ideas in systemic design, which at the time we called transformation design, realizing that that started to engender some hubris itself that we didn't yet know what we were doing, but there were, I, and so I would say that's how I got here and uh, in a sense, or one story for how I got here. And now I'm, as someone who's been a conscious settler in Canada um, and from, but as a US citizen um, and now um, will be, you know, living and working in Mexico starting next year with uh, as a professor at Tech de Monterey. So it's the arc of this talk has taken into account, or these talks has taken into account those different um, positions of mine too. So this is, because this is the last one, it also lands in winter, but then I haven't lived in the US in some time. So there's also a way in which I'm coming back to you know, ori original territory. Um, I've, um, so the, so the sort of spring was in Bogota and summer in Monterey and fall, uh, autumn in Toronto last, Toronto last week. And so this is, these have provided an opportunity to raise systemic questions that matter to me. And I think are also, th there's some revisioning that is rethinking what's been in, what's been in the past uh, in our history in RSD and the systemic design and and some key ideas that we that 
may work that I think need to be brought forward into the future. And there's overlap between the talks. So if you've seen them all, there'll be a little overlap and I'll make references to them. The, the key idea in this and why it's winter is that um, you start to see that, well, first of all, they, systemic design has not yet um, developed a real view or a theory on history making and, and, its, and its orientation to larger systems that may be informed by, by systems theory and by, by social cultural uh, theory and cultural evolution. So if we look at the way even that we address futures methodology and um, strategic foresight and futures uh, thinking within systemic design, it's often um, been integrated into the methodological side, but we aren't, um, I, I haven't seen enough yet. Uh, there's a little, but we're still really, I think, around the edges of, of constructing relationship between um, histories, futures, and the, the uh, development, growth, and evolution, and decline of systems. And so our usual, and the part of the reason for this is I think our usual praxis as designers is participatory. We get people engaged in the participation of creating their own vision or hubris, but their vision for what's possible in their futures, and that's necessary. It creates hope, it creates energy for taking on those futures, but it is also theory can lag, and we don't introduce theory, and I don't think we use it well enough in the relationship of systems and futures. So I'm asking in this talk also what theory, what philosophy is is missing, and one of the one of the pieces is more macro social systems. That is what, uh, and I'm going to introduce uh, the, the civilization as the, as at least in my view, the largest scale that we can effectively design for, uh, for solidarities. That would be that would be correct. That would be well placed um, for our. So it's, it could be multiple nations. It could be large. It could be larger than an empire. Saying that we're designing for that, but for the, but it is go, goes beyond how we even think of the boundary, the temporal, structural boundaries, even of, of political jurisdictions, and and so there are theories, historical systems theories, biodynamics, other futures theories that could that could introduce things. I'm going to bring up three perspectives that I think bring some bring some uh, light and some value to consider. For this, and I'll start with uh, Tony Fry's design future. It's challenge to design to lead to redirection in an era of sustainment. So, design futuring from was it seven, I believe, was um, it was an introduction to an approach to what we didn't call systemic design at the time, but was a, a, a radical rethinking of 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 future creation not just from a participatory perspective, but design as a redir redirection toward a new era of sustainment. People weren't even talking about the Anthropocene, but his term, even if we aren't using it, if, even if it doesn't have the same use in that way, I think it is more meaningful in terms of what we mean by the potential of that era, that we can sustain in that era. The Anthropocene has some kind of apocalyptic overtones to it, which um, and and also some some uh, concerns that may be raised by the geologists in the room, but the sustainment was not. I think his he also um, had one of the first keynotes. So at my we had Bogota, we had Don Norman, and, and Tony Fry also spoke remotely um, to the audience there. Sustainment he kind of compares to the Enlightenment. That is as an era that could uh, unleash creativity rethinking of, of our or, or theory and practice and an ontological revisioning of how we're being in the world. Uh, and he's followed from that in a number of other books and it's, it's still, I think, as we look almost tw 20 years from, I mean, so his early ideas certainly go back to the 90s in this. So, you know, these are long-term kind of programs, research programs. And recently, Tony Fry and Dominique Pereira in the Context um, Journal, um, uh, the SDA, uh, the Journal of Systemic Design, in our in our first volume this year, proud to have uh, their article on contra innovation, which is about redirection, 
against the defuturing that is so inherent in 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 the in the systems that that, that we're working with very often the legacy system i'd also introduced uh, klaus krippendorf who um who gave one as one of his last probably well attended pro um, public talks at rst10 in in delft um on from uncritical design to critical examinations of its systemic consequences. And uh, um, Klaus Krippendorf uh, passed away in 2021, and so this is, I'd, I'd like to reintroduce his work, have you reread re it or find it on the, uh, the uh, symposium proceedings. I think his legacy in his, th that's available in his talk, reorients the systemic design community towards a, a, the, a critically informed design as interventions in pers in what he called persistent artifact ecosystems. So we're not just criticizing the um, design processes or critiquing how artifacts are created or their impact, but that they become part of systemic artifact ecosystems that have that 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 create their own universes over time and that we need to be able to anticipate these and to also intervene with them. And his quote for that developed a design discourse aimed at keeping the culture which they work viable while protecting the socially desirable human agency of, uh, available. And so there, these are several other points from that I'd like to raise from, from his presentation, but just as a, uh, also to look at some other references into a critique that are that are outside of design, but that we employ in design quite a bit. Jacques Arul, um, Ivan Illich, uh, Marsha McLuhan's um, remedies, if you will, and foresight against socio-technical oppression of um, that, that can be, um, that is um, an inherent, that can be a process in which um, that uh, oppression can be uh, embedded into systems through the human agency, and also human agency can um, critique, um, intervene, and and um, and we we often use the term now exnovate, that is to withdraw um, uh, from innovation to change the innovation and how we're thinking about it. And so again, these critiques of systems and practices, ecologies of artifacts, can start to create a language for um, for more powerful critiques that come from 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 this um, background uh, available in systemic design. Um, I think one of the other uh, one of my points is that this we can through through this kind of critique, we can make it we can create spaces for committed participants, which is a term for stakeholder is stakeholders that it's kind of a, become kind of a bland term that we uh, may not uh, open up and examine closely enough. We think, what do we mean by the stakeholders or actors in a complex system that are of interest to us or that we are finding design solidarities with? And say that we could call them committed participants, the people who are committed within the system as participants, even if we are not, and that potential for them to to enable them to design their worlds for you know for the longer term um, so in increasing the diversity of the ecology of artifacts into which designs enter building rival platforms and social rival social systems new systems that take shape before the old ones are dissolved and so that's kind of the winter transformation process um, and a couple of other points I think come from, from Klaus, preser pre preserving the openness of self-reflective design discourse, having an active critique and discourse in, in this community and to uh, consider how the design it can be taught as an undisciplinable pr profession, which just, I'm not gonna try to define what he meant by that. I think this is one of those po possibilities. So another perspective is complex social systems. And this I see as the, as sy the systems theory, systems sciences contribution to what became 
systemic design, at least from my entry point into it. And so I think social systems theory itself has, um, within system science, has lost vitality and currency since the 1990s. It was a, a thriving field from the 1970s until about the time that 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 design took on, that is, des designerly approaches to um, to ex exploring complex systems, systemic design, when before we called it that, was starting to merge with the design intent of Thaler Banathy's designing social systems in a changing world, or Warfield societal systems, or Lumen's social systems approach. There, if we look at you do a search across uh, contemporary social systems theory, not system dynamics, not hard systems or emancipatory or soft systems, but social systems, the last well-cited title is my colleague Kenneth Bausch, um, the emerging consensus in social systems theory in 2001, so a year after I got my PhD. And I was part of Ken's uh, discourse community with, he was co-author with, um, Alexander Christakis of, of uh, how people harness their uh, collective wisdom and power in, in collaboratories of democracy. Right? So this is, and, and Ken died a few years ago himself. But it's almost as if that consensus had left then to, okay, we have a consensus and now there's nothing new. There has been very little that is actually breaking new ground in social systems theory, right, in, in the um, system sciences, um, conferences and, and, con and communities that I'm part of, um, it is, I'm not saying it's rehashing the older theories, but it's continuing to keep them alive, but there's not a lot of new work. So I think there's, there's a way in which um, social systems design as a pragmatic application of the, of the development of, of learning in social systems developed um, kind of leaped forward with Russell Acoff's work in the 1980s, and with him leading a whole pro program in the business in the Horton Business School at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as at the same time Hassan Ozbekov, who was the advisor to the Club of Rome that, that my mentor Christakis worked with. There was this flourishing of social systems as uh, as a framework for addressing enterprises, businesses, design of, of organizations, of, of governments, policies, and, and the actual ecologies of artifacts that were used by people and practices. So I think we've seen that social systems design, I think the vitality of that has shifted to systemic design. At least I'm willing to claim it and to say that this is where it where we can hold it and, and, and invite the systems community to, uh, to give it new life. Now, stakeholder-driven social systems design, unfortunately, oddly, is not as well known. Uh, um, it is known in the systems field, even though there are hundreds of papers uh, on the processes that Warf John Warfield and, uh, and uh, Alekos Christakis developed. Um, it's still, and it draws on very Real applications and practices in, uh, you know, in, in, in policy design of of, of um, uh, uh, networks and agreements and and everything from social startups to whole organizations to to um, the um, the U.S. Defense Department's procurement process, which was or which was um, changed in the 1990s as a result of a large project that John Warfield. Um, advised on. And so those are different conceptions of a social system uh, as a system, as a social system. And I'd say whenever we actually talk about it, perhaps picking up on, on Chelsea's comment about that or reflection that when we're, we're working with policies or government, that we're working with people at all points. But when we're working with systems, we're, we're working with the social system. There are practices, agreements, histories that take shape as, as ways of practicing from the past into the future that are incrementally changed, but retain their purpose, they retain their, their character, their fit within culture. But the, a critical concern, that's a point of critique, 
is that we have difficulty in languaging or bringing voice to unconcealing the managerial processes that are part of holding those social systems in place when they can organ self-organize to actually sustain defuturing. That is to continue to reduce, Tony might see it, or at least how I would interpret it, that defuturing is reducing the potential for better future outcomes because we have reduced the scope of protection in a corrupted system. And so the third perspective on this history making addresses another, um, maybe not as large, there's, there's a lot larger literature if we go beyond uh, Fernando Flores and Flores, Spinoza, and Dreyfus's Disposing of Worlds. This is from 1997. And like, like uh, I think Ozbekan's work was 50 years ahead of its time. I think this is 20, 30 years ahead of its time, maybe longer. We still are not yet really cat very well caught up to what, what they were, um, this, this, I think, significant um, work about essentially a, a type of designing ontological design for changing histories through actions that are defined at its small social systems level. That and it isn't even about scale, it's about the, in, in the way through the creation of speech acts that is a type of um, um, illocution, illocutionary, illocutionary um, 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 intention that continues to take a, a vision forward for what's possible. They use the example of Mothers Against Drunk Driving and how that um, started as really a small group of intentional citizens and then it became law in states and law in the land. But it, um, it was you know, holding holding on to an anomaly, a disharmony, as he calls it, as the discovery for a significant context for its re resolution. He talked about the, the skill of interpretive speaking as the way that the disclosure of new, new possible worlds can, can be revealed in ways that, in, that inspire change and create um, changes in history then you look back at those um, changes. And so that other than speech acts, the other uh, new, uh, well, which isn't a new particular for them because speech acts, uh, speech acts um, from ontological design was probably first raised at least by Flores and Flores and Winograd's work um, understanding computers and cognition in the eighties. But the, uh, this book raised design practices that I think are still worthy of remembering or, or bringing in, into our practice about art articulation, which is the language around this disharmony that can make it come alive for others to recognize as meaningful and as powerful for them. The cross appropriation from, from one effective context to a new context, uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving had cross appropriations from other effective social action processes and reconfiguration, which is essentially the design of the elements of that process so that it's novel and that it can be, he calls this an entrepreneurial civic, the potential for uh, entrepreneurial civic in intervention. Um, and then those cross appropriation then can spin off other social action solidarities, such as in my experience and the work that we've done with, for example, using the Paul Hawkins drawdown book as a as an opportunity for creating um, uh, civic conversations around the science of uh, the, you know the translating the scientific impacts uh, or the scientific knowledge around um, climate carbon environmental impacts and then translating those to local levels and then creating kind of city campaigns and educational programs in drawdown Toronto which is a cross appropriation and that also has now become part of Paul Hawkins' regeneration movement, which I think is an example of that. Um, and so the, a, a question I'll ask and I'll follow up here is can we design for something like humane civilizations that is, that is not intentionally like reconfiguring the civilization, but that bringing these types of history making projects forward that can encompass 
these values and that can also speak clearly about new possibilities. So, um, and so part of the winter that I'll bring up here also is that in, in, in some theories of civilization, the West has been in a winter for, that is in the decline of, of, the, of, of the Western civilization from its, from its origins in, in Greece and Rome even, where, where it was the, this kind of brutally active uh, culture. There's a theory that um, um, I'll touch on later, looking at a, at a few of these, that in, in the winter, we kind of ride the coattails of, of, of a powerful civilization that we don't have to continue to, um, that we don't have the vitality of the origination or of the spring of that civilization. And, that, and this is why it may be difficult to create like a new musical genre or to create a new form of play or a new sport. It's just kind of not going to be taken up at this stage in a civilization. It might in different other contexts, but at a very large scale, this is part of like, are we in that state? And so if that's if we are in that state, that also gives us constraints for what's possible in history and where we ought to focus our attention. And so I think one of the one of the um, constraints we're going to be facing is this is is to recognize that globalization has been overcome by its own global events um, over the last you know, decade or or so that. Western, my point is that Western institutions still, there's a lot of inertia still. Um, you know, global, in, uh, global institutions persist as if, you know, we still have this kind of social contract on global cooperation, participation. Uh, but when I actually look very clearly at the effectiveness of the United Nations, United Nations Security Council, the World Health Organization, NATO, the um, OPCW, they all have really faded away this way, and and have been. So there have been, you know, notable declines depending on, on how you want to characterize those. And yet they have a lot of inertia. They will continue. But these are global organizations that were formed at a different point in our history, and they're going to be sustained because that's kind of what they know what to do. But if they're sustained at beyond a point where they're where they're um, not bringing where they're not meeting their purpose very well to all the participants globally that need to be part of that. So we've got a, a real reason for the breakdown of globalization in terms of energy. The rise of the global south and the changes in energy trade and energy trade around the, around the world, but also the kind of sedimentation of, of power holders in those institutions that have been there, that have been there for a long, you know, there's, it's called the uh, circulation of the elites. That hasn't happened. We've got a lot of the same in, uh, organizations that support these institutions that have that have not refreshed them. They have not been revitalized. And so we may be facing, you know, a once in a lifetime or or even many lifetimes civilization level crisis. There is this term called the poly crisis, which is being used um, in in the literature. It was raised actually. I talked about this in the autumn talk in at, at some length, so I won't bring it again, but I'll just mention, you know, that, you know, the, the recent uh, reformulation of the poly crisis has been to take it from its original represent, uh, its original use in its, in its description of the, of the mix of, of uh, economic, financial, um, sociocultural, and environmental crises in Europe to a global level. So this is kind of a, like a shot in the arm for globalism, but Thomas Homer Dixon and, ha and the Cascade Institute and others have, have been introducing it. It's been picked up by the World Economic Forum, which is one I didn't mention before. But these are, it's kind of like the same crisis in, in a new language, and I'm skeptical of that. And, it's, and I think that the framing of the poly crisis is missing a lot of actual real crisis elements that in a sense are actually present, but it are not included in the typical way it's framed. So I'll just say, I said more about that in the fall. And so this is more about where that leads. And so I'd say the other challenge is that we're seeing again, this happens once a century maybe, is that there's a change in what's called the world system out of um, Wallerstein's um, notion. Wallerstein died a couple of years ago as well, Emmanuel Wallerstein. and and. He was predicting at the time that 
this was starting to change, that a new world system was forming, but it's also pluriversal and it's also multi-civilization. So it's, it's not, so Wallerstein didn't believe that there were in the same multipolar sense that there could be multiple world systems at the same time, that it would form as one. Um, and so there is some discussion of that in those journals and that side. But I think from a, from a social systems perspective, these are all really key concepts to be aware of and to consider where, our, where the impact of history making potential might be. And so our, what I'd also then add to this is that our governing capacities, certainly at the global, but to design for systems change and at macro social systems remains poor. So who is, um, who is fund, you know, how do we create organizations that can fund, maintain, direct um, large constellations at large scales of change? I have been part of many of these groups, meeting by Zoom, a lot of them are remote, name them, um, you know, we can talk about them later, but I just say I've been invited to and have been part of many of these. And the collaborative governance and the kind of, you know, mul multitude of experts that are part of these, these um, networks and configurations of, 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 of uh, system change groups are unwieldy and difficult to, re to direct towards the kind of redirection that we might work with. So we need find some alternatives as designers to working with kind of long, long, you know, large groups that may suffer from inertia, from being not necessarily even underfunded, but not having a, a real remit in terms of um, sponsorship by the committed participants in the systems that we are seeking to change. And they're often like more technocrats that are part, which I don't like to experience myself as, but it, it can be like that when we're all advising on these large transition and system change projects. So how should we, how ought we? It's a really normative question. Should we intervene? Should we muddle through? Should we be incremental? Should we look to grasp these kinds of change? And can we acknowledge that we're in a type of civilizational drift? That's not necessarily bad. There might be real opportunity for that if we could acknowledge it. That is that we don't waste our energy putting time into projects that are focused on the wrong thing. And we're not getting involved in the trap of designing for purposes that don't have the take up by the solidarities of the, of the participants in the system. So in, in, in Toronto, in the autumn in, uh, discussion, I had noted that futurists of which I'm a member of that community too through the strategic foresight innovation um, the master design program, which you started in, at, at OCAD in 2008. And um, so back at that time, all the future was 2020. And we were, so we had many years of designing foresight, um, uh, you know, um, foresight uh, uh, dossiers, portfolios, perspectives for 2020. And you know, there's a lot of scenario analysis work, a lot of designing for different arcs of futures, different horizons, trend analysis, horizon scanning, multi-method futures, um, uh, uh, design fiction, um, science fiction. But there were, there were actual real events that systems thinkers identified that futures so the economic systems thinkers that I follow, people like Charles Hughes Smith or Mark Stoneweapon, um, others that you might not know of. I mean, people that are almost, you know, like good bloggers were looking into the data and saying, this is, you know, this is what's going to be an outcome of you know, Fed's decision or QE, or there's obviously signaling breakdowns in the financial system that, you know, we should have been able to see those, you know, um, without having to be quantitative experts, at least to, to have access to that, those um, insights. And so if we are going to really work with pro-futuring sustainment, you know, with foundation systems that themselves are collapsing, shouldn't we be aware of what those foundation systems are and not using optimism to prop them up, particularly if we don't have any power agency in the system? 
And so, um, uh, so um, John Smart reconfigured uh, Jim Dator's four futures, and I like this representation because this is a mix of systems and futures concept from from Smart. And so, if we are are we in a continuation? You know, we're not in a continuation. We're acting as if we're in a continuation of the future left, which may have some discipline and continuity, limits and discipline, which you can see in the kind of long arc of the conservation of, of, a, of a system that is well supported and well sustained. But if we, if, if our civilization, that is the West, and its financial underpinnings are really in a decline in the collapse of, of, of the underpinning capital and, and financial system, and we're not even recognizing that in the poly crisis, or at least we're identifying in the poly crisis that there are economic inequality concerns, it's much bigger. It is just, it's massively bigger than that. We're not being honest about, you know, maybe we're just not sharing those observations, but we're not working them into our perspectives, and we're not considering how they affect other systems that we are ostensibly designing for. So I'd say which of those four futures are we are, are is our civilization really at, and does it make sense then, if we're if civilization that or that is the underpinnings of some of the systems are in a decline, that we should be in this, the bottom image creating, and I know a lot of us are working what we hope or believe will be the new system. We need many of those. We need many prototypes of those, and, I, and I'd say really the change groups that I've worked with really do imagine that they're creating and midwifing the new system as the old system is being hostage. This is based on Meg Wheatley's two loops theory of change, um, and also the last, uh, that was from the 90s, I think mid 90s originally, uh, late and then in, in a wonderful book with, with Deborah Freeze, Walk Out, Walk On, which was one of her several times of rethinking this whole thing, because <laughs> she had, <laughs> So if you read her series of work, that is a book of like, well, let's bring it back to the local where real change is happening in these different cities and projects. So it is a kind of a revelation. So I'd say we, so going back to the, the main point in the middle of this though, is like, so if we are working on originating and creating a new system that could take shape, how do we continue to, to continue to proceed with example of um, forward from the current base of declining systems in, in, and especially at the level of the global. I think there's a huge opportunity cost to get caught up in the systems that we are going to not able that we're that we can foresee that we will not have effective future change in them, even if it's it seems to be vital and that you know, the group of experts that we're working with seem to be making, um, uh, that we believe we're making progress, or it feels like there's a, but, you know, these are, at that kind of scale of contribution, it's very, or uh, envisioning, it can be, it, it's difficult to know um, um, how long a, uh, the outcomes, it may take for the outcomes to take shape. And so I'm just saying some of us, not all, might diverge or withdraw from supporting these unwieldy uh, global governance regimes and to find other uh, programs that will, that maybe start from creative side projects even that have the vitality of something like, like Floris' history making from holding on to a disharmony, creating uh, alternatives from that that might be cross appropriated and might spark you know, some new impact. And so I'll follow up with this. This could take like, this could be a whole course um, uh, on, on civilization theories. Um, this informs, I'm not gonna go into it in depth, but some of these I think are very powerful. So we'll talk about Peter Turchin's, but this is just like, are we, the question, are we in a civilization decline? How would we know? Well, all of them would say yes, and there are, um, and probably the oldest one here, and people don't, if you haven't actually read The Decline of the West, it's kind of, you know, um, it's, it, was, it was considered kind of a conservative classic even in its time, 100 years ago, 
Uh, but it is, it, it's beautifully written and has a, a theory that makes sense in terms of the change of futures. So it is a, um, it is the change of futures from season to season. So that's partly an homage even to Spengler that this is in winter because there are, um, it, it wasn't meant to be a, a foresight for what would change, especially in the United States. It was actually written from a, Euro, uh, a European or a Faustian perspective as, as the Western society as Faustian, that this is making deals of the devil, if you will. But, um, I, would, but I, would, I would recommend at least rereading an overview of what Spengler was saying and why he's now being, you know, he's really, his work is really trending. There's a reason for that. Um, Joseph Tainter's Collapse of Complex Societies. I mean, I'm now jumping ahead, um, you know, 70 years from Spengler, but, but uh, Joseph Tainter is still developing and speaking from this work. He spoke at the Stoa online at, at the Toronto um, Philosophy Group. Um, um, a year or two ago, and you know, and he's part of the the IFSS Systems uh, Society. His um, his formulation of and his work, his term for for civilization is complex society. So, are, and, and that's defined at a different scale than I think um, Spengler or others would recognize. So they can be smaller but coherent cultures that had an identity, had a rise, had a fall, had a collapse that was internally uh, that had internal functions um, that were relative to, to that collapse. Uh, Dmitry Orlov's um, reinventing collapse based on his experience from um, the, um, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, which as a, as, a, as a young person he experienced. And so in his 30s, he wrote, started writing a series of books of a theory of, of collapse that essentially followed um, um, from the first collapses, which really would be financial and then economic and commercial and then social, cultural, and that cultural would be last. His observation in, in the Soviet Union was that that cultural was last, that the financial underpinnings were first, and that it might not be reversible. Um, um, so uh, there's this, uh, John Michael Greer's, uh, who blogs as Echo Sophia, he's still very active. Um, his book more recently with decline and fall the empire um, and and the foot of future of democracy is um, not the foot of democracy in 21st century America is um, uh, he's part of the peak oil uh, community that I guess you could say or, or was at the time so if we go back 10 years before that there were a number of there were several hundred of us that were um, meeting on an annual basis and a lot in Yellow Springs, Ohio, where I was, on what, what might change in, uh, as a result of peak oil, how to prepare for it. And so he was, um, he was predicting the, the same kinds of things. These all have resonance with each other. If you read them all together, you'd probably wonder how I'm even got the energy to come up here and talk, but it's, but I actually see, you know, our potential, our, not my job, I can acknowledge this because I'm interested in the larger scale of social systems and what what we how we can in best interact with them. I think there's a real potential for a better theory of this. And one of those better theories is Peter Church and the magic diagram from his recent article, I mean very recent, 2023 Hoyer et al. So his um, and he also has a new book called um, End Times, which is really about the about the end times uh, being a play on words, but he's, he doesn't mean it um, literally, of course, but from his, his theory and the kind of um, change that uh, in, in American society and in other complex societies that may be part of the West, he has, he has been foreseeing for 20 years from, from a very large database and using what the historical study. Um, cyclic history theory that is not like a repeating regular cycle, which is what um, uh, uh, Strauss and Howe's fourth turning would be. So I didn't mean to skip over that one, but that's another one that I think designers in particular would do find interesting because it has uh, it has um, uh, the 
the power of the metaphorical, um, the power of the metaphors of a change of generations and the identity of regular generational change that, that has a, a character of, um, a, a character of, of, of understandable, observable, um, patterned change in 80 year cycles from, from crisis to crisis. So if you look at the last time there was a fourth turning, it was the Great Depression, the start of World War II, um, international and global depression, huge uh, social change, change in the social contract. Uh, so the fourth turning, which the scientists like Turchin are, are explicitly skeptical of because it's, uh, it's, he calls it more crustian, it's more top down, they've got a new theory, it seems to fit Turchin's, but they, um, you know, so I'd, I'd recommend, you know, seeing again, like overviews of these, but really the Turchin has done the work with the data to support what types of patterns actually may be underpinning even some of these other cycles. So these are interesting because to me, is these are system cycles that are being represented in different theories, all of which may have something to contribute. Um, I'm bringing them up here just to show that there's such a variety of them and they are still, I mean, very fertile. Other social historians, I mean, you can go back to, again, 50, 100, uh, 50, 80 years ago, Toynbee, uh, the Sorokin, and Nima Parvini, who's uh, a UK professor, just wrote Prophets of Doom, which is, um, which he recounts uh, these social historians going back to Vico. So it's from Vico, actually, up to like Spangler, and he touches on Turchin and, and, um, and Joseph Tainter. But this diagram from, uh, on kind of what the poly crisis might lead to is, is uh, an analysis coming out of sociocultural uh, uh, analysis of Peter Turchin's database called the Sashat, Sashat uh, database. It's in the next slide. So Turchin, um, uh, Turchin has developed um, a, a journal and, uh, and, and, a, and a field of analysis called cloudynamics, or Clio from the, the Greek, the Greek um, um, muse for history and the dynamics of that muse and, and STT, which is st uh, structural demographic theory. And so it's his, the, this is based on cultural evolution and the structural demographics within cultures. And, uh, and in the mathematical modeling of historical cycles. And so these are, um, he's developed um, statistically strong covariances of historical patterns with consistent anticipated changes of cultures. And so there are a couple of diagrams that I'll point to here that are important to recognize or that, that really show the, the power of this that come out from um, um, an analysis of historical databases going back to, back to um, Roman history and across many civilizations is showing that there is a, a 50, about a 50 year cycle of the of the increase in power of or of holding of power of elites that is not letting go but holding it kind of beyond their their cell date and uh, and so this is the what it calls elite overproduction that when elites hold their position and then a society produces too many people that are that are well credentialed so universities actually create more people that are designated for elite positions, but there are not no, there are not the places for them to actually hold within the society. And so this creates a tension or a rivalry between existing elites and their ability to, to take more and those that have nowhere to go and that are frustrated. So this is a demographic, generational, and a, a kind of power dynamic that is recognized as being in a cycle with um, popular well-being. So when elites are weak, there is popular well-being. When elites are very strong and, and there's competition with, with new elites, the, the people are miserable. And the, the observation is that the people are miserable because they're being, their needs aren't being attended to, that elites are busy fighting each other and the people are not getting their needs met. Um, 
and so this elite overproduction is like a key dynamic that drives it. Uh, and then there's another one that's even more critical, which is the political instability cycle. So this, every 140 years, there is a extremely steep hockey stick turn where um, the political, where it's based on political stress index. And it's 140 years, which coincidentally is seven generations. And seven generations ago, there's another fourth turn, which is the Civil War. So there's an era of good feelings, which is what calls it this post-war. And that has dropped and it's been displaced by now and they predicted this 20 years ago. And then 10 years ago is when the talks happened. So the, the, this is, gives you an idea of the, the, com the complex factors that are taken into account in the Sitchat um, Global History Data Bank um, between um, elements of the state and stability of population. So that's, so you could say these factors are not necessarily at issue in other civilizations. These are at issue more in the West and in the U.S. than in, well, I guess Canada because that's one part where it ties very closely. And so, but I want to give a definition of civilization. I'll give you a couple references to that. The special category of states with a lengthy and uninterrupted history, renounced authenticity as citizens and leaders who are prepared to resolutely uphold culture. Um, Huntington said it was the highest form of cultural identity, differentiated by language, history, culture, and traditions. Huntington, saying that this is back in the early 90s, identified nine civilizations, and clash of civilizations. And if we look at what we would define as civilizations, we might name them different, differently, but they're now, um, we may have, I'm, uh, there are, there's uh, the global south and uh, the discussions around multipolarity. There's a recognition that there may be seven civilization states forming, that is arrangements that are civilizational that have come from the through the glo global south. And so if you notice that the global south are no, um, so areas of Africa, um, um, groups of Latin American countries, India, China, Russia, um, uh, and the um, ne uh, West Asia, but also even the reconciliation of Saudi Arabia and Iran recently showing new, new um, recent aggregations that are, that, are com that are showing that this was also oppression. So this could be a good thing if we recognize them as um, being co-equal with the West, which seems like we're not ready to do. So we, I mean, we might be in this room, but um, this is part of the, the other kind of larger pocket. So there's this emergence of civilization at the same time the moment of the global may be dissolving. And so this is a, the formation of a new trading system, a new world system that is also potential. And if that's a new new world system, that means the worldwide trading relationships and financial financial arrangements may significantly change in the next few years. And so this is, um, you know, there's other points on that. I'll just quickly go. This is also showing up as BRICS plus. So not just Brazil, Russia, uh, India, China, South Africa. But they are already adding by January, um, you know, these you know six states, including recent Saudi Arabia and Iran, who are seem are quickly cooperating. And you would believe that within six months that kind of change could have happened. And there's also a change in the lar in the economies and how the global world and how these countries. And I would recommend um, following Michael Hudson as an economist on really showing where this is going. And so some of the other global institutions, World Bank, IMF, et cetera, will have to change because there are other institutions that that the BRICS are already forming. And so these kind of, this is my landing point. So if there are eight civilizations, say, in the multipolar world systems, what's the solidarity group for global problems such as the global poly crisis or other formations? So I'd say this also comes out of the Club of Rome work I said that originally in my quote that originally the Club of Rome and this the glo and the global revolution. The terminology for kind of the global framing and, and that as a, and the West's kind of ownership of the global has been formed since 1970 by, you know, people that were very influential in my, in my field. Um, and the, you know, the more that I'm seeing this take shape, the more I'm seeing 
that um, this split in the Club of Rome between the limits to growth and computer modeling, top-down approaches of system dynamics, hard systems analysis, versus social system design. So the original analyses from Club, from Club of Rome said that the, the, the limits to growth were necessary to balance Western growth, but not the periphery. That is not the, the growing economies, which, were, which are now the global south, which require growth to sustain a population. Well, that even that point is no longer really included in, in I mean, the SDGs are still treated as a type of development, development uh, program. In a, in a large way, and I don't think that they're being informed by the by the rapid new changes of the global south. There are other points about globalization I could make, like John Ralston Saul said in 2005 that you know that he had a book of the collapse of, of globalism then, and his and a lot of what he said then actually happened, but he said there's a lot of inertia. <laughs> and so, to summarize really quickly, on this was like the RSD 11. You can go back and see that presentation, but the global problematique was formed in 1970 by Hassan Ospikan, also with Christakis and Raj. It was the original prospectus that led to the, to the limits to growth. It, Ospikan identified 49 con continuous critical problems as the poly crisis of its time. His images here in the lower right show that he critiqued the analytical mindset that tried to separate these problems into, I mean, even if we can name them, said that they were all going to become one like mega crisis, if you will, over time. So in 1970, at the last moment, he had to intervene into them independently. And while the 49 continuous critical problems are this legacy, uh, it's like the, the wording of those don't need much change. They all will, when, when I use these in the classroom um, uh, reconfigurations, they, we, they hardly, we hardly ever change them. But these distinctions are, we should, we should revise these distinctions. And we, sh and we, I think, can look at the normative issue of using the value base of the stakeholders to make these changes. So it's, um, that is the stake, the committed participants in the system. This is a key idea of Ospicons that was never fulfilled by the Club of Rome and uh, uh, certainly not in the limits to growth, which didn't do any um, stakeholder interviews of the people that were subject to the problems that they were describing. And the Hassan Ozbekan proposed an early version of the social system design, which is critical of that technocratic mindset. So a lot in common with people like Peter and Hirsch. And so we called this, it's also called the perma crisis. And I think the Club of Rome is perhaps rightly seen as a kind of shadow governance think tank even then, informing these policy positions of global programs. But they haven't adapted to, I think, the changes that we're seeing in, in, in the world, as I've described, around civilizations and changes in the global south and, and, and new institutions. But the, this was an early view of the poly crisis becoming one big thing in Hassan's early PowerPoint. All those 49 become one big bubble. And I think he was 50 years ahead of his time and his position that it was unethical to design social systems without the full participation of stakeholders. And so critiquing the problems themselves now, after 50 years, you know, the technocracy and systems thinking is the hard system still kind of pervades. I mean, we've softened it up around the edges and we've brought in other forms of systems theory, but um, uh, emancipatory systems, postmodern, are social systems design, I think, has really morphed into what we're doing in systemic design to a great extent. But in terms of the kind of framing of, uh, of, of, of the problems, in, you know, which is something that designers are very sensitive to, even the, the frame of something even using the word problem assumes the resolution, assumes the problem-solving attitude that Ozbekan, uh, Christakis, and others were critical of that we can't use a problem-solving mindset in these types of issues. And so if, you, we, if we are self-reflexive and do our own mapping on, this is a map of 49 CCPs from recently, uh, critical, continuous critical problems. My proposal is developing more local problematiques that might help us break free of the old frames. And my position is also that these are now civilizations. It would be great to do, say, eight of them. 
but um, but uh, there would be, but if we also then look, I've started to do some of this without yet the stakeholders, but I'm proposing other maps that would be from a global south perspective and rather than um, like Western frame problems such as you know obsolete education systems and um, financial systems that are you know obsolete for the West, there are oppressive financial systems in the global south, Western corporate media controls, all the internet platforms and most of the world's information ecosystems. So that leads to the one above it. Driving factors when we do this analysis. Um, Non-Western leaders have limited access to the levers of finance in particular, the world of finance and conflicts between indigenous tradition um, in the South, global South and postmodern global culture. Those might be different driving factors than the kinds of factors that we're working on. So this is, uh, we're all finished, which is where I could, I think we can consider different interventions with different new approaches to larger scale theories of change, um, creating, going further with this pluriversal problematique from different global south perspectives. Uh, thanks, Peter. It's a tremendous amount of work. It's like, it's an amazing art that you've put together. Um, there's a lot there. Questions? Anyone? Like, so I, I guess I, so I often talk to students about what design might look like after a collapse, right? Like, or what does it mean to design for um, what comes next? Um, and I've struggled to come up with a name for what that sort of design might be called at this point, but I think that's probably a good thing. Um, but so I, I guess my my question is about designing for, I mean, Victor talked a little bit today about sort of designing for like the end of life of the system, right? Um, and those end of life stages are, are transitional stages, right? Moving from one stage to another, right? So what, I guess, what do you feel like students should know in order to be designing for that sort of large scale transition. around then, uh, then why then um i think it's also helpful to create stories that can help us understand 
what we might do in different situations. And these could be um, uh, design fiction, narratives that, that bring to life um, um, people's concerns, but also the, the, you know, so that they, so that we can, like, as you would say, if, if there was a, a type of collapse, so there's a, and we wanna go beyond financial, though I think the, the, the felt uh, social cultural changes that could occur like in science, like in good science fiction or in cyberpunk fiction and to raise that raise those as, as possibilities where we could see where the opportunities for for um, for uh, intervention or for holding a holding bringing forth an alternative in advance of different critical events that could have led to led to those outcomes so it's way doing better forms of outcome analysis, uh, but using stories in the outcome mapping, using um, narratives and, um, and as well as uh, theory that might give shape to that rather than just inventing stories that come from our own um, envisioning or experience, but to actually have it structured around enough theory so that they, that, that might give some guidance, some um, guidance to how the, um, the, um, th those changes might occur. Uh, but in, we also need to be continually collaborating though on, on other options. This is where my, I think my concern for like working with very large scale change projects that don't actually lead to, uh, to actual change, but may morph into other groups and may morph into other groups is that they have this continuity of, 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 um, development as um, as potential projects that are looking for a point to jump off and to to find a place to make a difference. And maybe I'm just impatient, but I'm also seeing that that um, when if we if we happen to be working on the wrong unit of analysis or the wrong place for change, we may get caught up in just making large large prototypes that can't be used or not making the impact. When what Floris is talking about, I see done much less, which is actually creating a working, you know, working action group that may start as, as a prototype that might be advised by design. So such as the Mothers Against Drunk Driving example in Floris, um, if, if we looked at, and I'll, I'll just say for the group that we've been working with in Toronto, which is not a large group, I mean, there may be, you know, six people in the core group of Drawdown Toronto that's now changed to um, regenerating Toronto. And that's also, that grew out of, um, out of a group from before that was called Unify Toronto. So this has been a different approach, not a very, not a large kind of sprawling group of experts, but a s smaller group of not even designers, but of, of people that have done other change work of other, you know, you know, uh, leadership in the community and have good networks and are willing to struggle through and work through um, local change programs, but also to share with other, in this case, uh, what draw, the Drawdown Toronto did was shared with other cities. And there, uh, there is um, Drawdown BC and other cities in Canada. And now with regeneration, that's moved to many other cities. So I do see something like that as being the potential for creating the next system because you've got multiple sites with a common identity that are working towards common aims, but at local scales that that could also learn from each other. So they're doing different things. They're not doing, you know, text, you know, working from a cookbook approach or anything. So I think um, I think um, social and systemic design, um, uh, uh, I guess leaders, because in a way we this is a, a type of system leadership, as well a type of uh, what um, uh, Victor was calling system stewardship, and is also known as convening or system leadership, kind of depending on, on your frame for that. But part of the system leadership is identifying the system of change in which a group or people can take a a leadership approach in the sense of being first, not being in charge, but of maybe being first as the leader and convening the concept of that system and holding the, the, the viewpoint of what the change could be.
So in a change appropriate to that scale of the social system. And that could be civilizational, although I'm not sure how we best address that one. I mean, this is this is the first time I've put a lot of this out there. This could be, you know, this could be courses, but I, I wanted to to show the background to the thinking for this and also the background to my concern that led to this. This is probably my most tentative talk, which is also why it's, you know, in, in winter, it's like, hear me out, you know, um, what do you think? Is there any, you know, what other feedback would, would help me if I were to continue down this path? Or, or is this uh, perhaps too, you know, um, is this not going to be profitable? You know, for for other reasons, if, has anyone else tried this? Questions? Yeah, Jill. Jill's here. Um. Thanks so much, Peter. I I'm just wondering how what advice you have for a, a hopeless designer or other hopeless out there. Um. These are wonderful ideas, but um, you know how many designers are invited to these tables where they can participate, or people who are key decision makers who might even dare to think that they can do things differently, or heck, imagine a science fiction future. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe it starts first with getting people getting people familiar, comfortable, and okay with being playful um even in a disaster scenario um so yeah i wonder what advice you. Okay. you have i'm not sure advice is probably that but i understand the question and also where you're coming from with this i'd say that's uh the the designers in systemic design have tremendous amount to offer i may not be making i'm not actually presenting this i see as a um as as a, as what might seem like a hopeful invitation, but I think it really is. And also, there we have been inviting designers to participate in these different projects. In fact, uh, Nicole Norris last week in Toronto, in, in the panel mentioned some of the work that we've done, the flourishing business model that is that she's continued to develop not only in her PhD but in in Georgia at the Social Innovation Center. So there are ideas and projects that that can create the different elements and different prototypes of what can be a better next system and you have to be patient so the flourishing business model concept which is a contra innovation against the oster walter business model canvas that includes society the relationship of the firm to the ecosystem and the use of ecosystem actors and services and bio stocks i mean it incorpor fully incorporates your thinking into the environment yeah, it's, that's a very high high sided paper, but it's still not not diffused all around the world or anything. It's ten years old now. There are, you know, we have um, at this at these scales. There may be a, a concept like that or something like like even regenerating Toronto. It was drawdown just a year ago. I mean, so I, we don't even know what direction it's going to go. So these these groups are out there and these these working groups would would love to have designers at least for things like envisioning the envisioning their content bringing better narratives to their change story uh, creating um, you know um, helping think through the frames and how things are presented because um, um, let's say um the people who are in, you know who who are no social action and change leaders may be inspirational and very dedicated but may not always have um uh the, the design sense for uh, you know for for presenting the um you know the scope and the opportunity or or seeing how how um significant you know the the significant opportunities that could occur it's it, so there are some different uh ways of thinking that i just like to introduce that that might that might help but i think that there are there are certainly many ways to get involved. Um, I think it's looking at the emergence of what could be the next, you know, what could be the next system, what could be the, the potential contra innovation that would make a difference. And in working even in, in one project and then another may lead to, you know, with many, many uh, that is faster shifts between them, if uh, at the same time being patient 
and, and sticking with an idea for as long as it takes as well. So it may take, it may morph through different forms. And the other thing is, is you know, the, the biggest, I think, uh, future impact that we have to really worry about would be a significant change in, in our financial arrangements that would, that would accompany um, uh, changes in uh, the financial, you know, in our financial system and, 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 and high inflation, it would be described as that, but the underpinnings of the system will have longer term effects that we may not always be aware of. And so there, you know, there's interesting work being done in rethinking new economies. And those I think, which I've been interested in, those are very hard to implement when we aren't at the point where we actually need them. You know, so it's, it's the same. I think that's one of the reasons that the flourishing, the flourishing business model has not yet been used by like um, hundreds of startups or is being demanded by, by VCs or even in, in, in social innovation, uh, you know, catalyst um, uh, agencies and things like that. Peter, we've got a question online here. Okay. Uh, oh, so it's uh, Gordon. He says, uh, hi, Peter. Thanks oh. for your talk. Perhaps because of my relationship with Bella ben Benethy, I've always seen mm. much of systemic design as a next step in the evolution of his and others' work in social systems design, a morphing as you describe. Mm. Earlier in this talk, though, you seem to suggest that social systems design tapered off in the 1990s. If so, mm. I guess I'm not entirely clear how you are distinguishing the two. Please clarify. Well, also, uh, Bella Benethy, uh, I don't know, the. I think it was so died around the same years that Russell Acoff and Hassan Ozbekan, so in the early 2000s. So the continuation of their work didn't continue. So that's part of it. And also with, with um, Kenneth Bausch. So I just say some of the, the key authors in the, in who were framing their work as not just only social systems, but social systems design have um, as, as, as they haven't continued their work, we've we've seen that that those well even like Gordon that have followed and and me, we aren't necessarily following with new social systems theories. Instead, what I say the distinction is that we've moved to the stronger form of of design in the social system. I think the distinction between Banathy's work and our work is that this is very design led, and Banathy's work was was a vision from a system's first perspective that that used design as its as its uh, implementation of the system it was very a, lo a lot of it was, was was theoretically sound but also very abstract and didn't lead to to the the types of embodied prototypes and the types of um of of new design thinking work that has emerged over the last decade so i do i do think that you know so perhaps we're in agreement that there's uh, some continuity uh, available in systemic design that is picked up from that field. But I think we actually attend IFSS, the, the whole domain of social systems and social systems design is, not, is no longer framed that way, even in the system society or as much in the literature. And that's why I was looking at, you know, the an analysis of the recent citations to the most kind of you know the highest cited social social systems work, and it came up as Kenneth Bausch's consensus, you know, the emerging consensus, and that was more social systems. So that relied a lot on Lumen and Habermas, and which is also very current then. Um, but in terms of social systems design, I think that we have you know it, it falls to the next generation to define that and. And I'm glad Gordon can be part of that next generation. Gordon found that answer to be fair. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, we're going to um, take a short break right now. Thank you. And then uh, obviously we don't really have time for open space. We have to sort of vacate this room by five. So uh, what I think I'd just like to do is to just bring everyone back in a couple minutes and let's just have sort of an open conversation about uh, with some reflection and just think about um, you know uh, maybe the next RSD and uh, anything else any others any other sort of closing thoughts that anyone would like to offer <laughs> 